again, Hosea chapter 1, verse 1 to 9. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beri, during the reigns of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke to Hosea, he said this to him, Go and marry a woman of prom- promiscuity and have children of promiscuity, for the land is committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. So he went and married Gomer, daughter of Diblim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will bring bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in Jezreel Valley. She conceived again and gave birth to a daughter, and the Lord said to him, Name her lo Hamath, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. I will certainly take them away, but I will have compassion on the house of Judah, and I will deliver them by the Lord their God. I will not deliver them by bow, saw, sword, sorry, or war, or by horses or cavalry. After that, after, sorry, Goma had weaned Lohamrath, she conceived and gave birth to a son. Then the Lord said, said Name him Lohamai, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Pastor Craig. Father, thank you. Thank you for books like Hosea that show us the triumph of your grace, how unrelenting your grace is and how much we need it. Lord, as we begin this wonderful book, show us your truths in it. Show us the gospel. Show us Christ. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Look, there's no doubt that the most stunning picture of grace in the Bible is the cross. But what's the most stunning story of grace? Many would say the parable of the prodigal son. He's the son who spurns his father's love, leaves his home, wastes his inheritance, but ends up reduced to desperation. He's in a foreign land. He's in trouble And the father is looking out, longing for him to return. And finally he sees him on the horizon and he girds up his loins and he runs to him and he kills the fatted calf. It's an undeserved show of grace. But for me, for me, the most striking story of grace in the Bible is the one we're beginning this morning. It's the parable that begins the book of Hosea in the first three chapters. Now it's a parable... But it's not just a parable that's a story. This is a parable that God commands to be lived out, to be actually lived out in the life of Hosea. Now, here's the difference between the prodigal son and the parable that begins Hosea. In the parable of the prodigal son, you read it and you put yourself in the place of the prodigal son. Uh, You realise, you know, that's us. We've wasted everything. We deserve nothing. Uh, We're living among the unclean pigs, and then we receive grace. And you're very thankful for that. But in Hosea's enacted parable, God says, I want you to see things from my side. I want you to put yourself in my shoes. He says, I want you to understand what it's like to be a faithful husband, betrayed by a wife that you love and shower your love upon. And he In this, we're going to see that while justice might call for vengeance, justice might say, you know what? She deserves to be divorced. She deserves severe punishment. He goes and he loves her again and sacrifices everything. But we're meant to empathise with God. We're meant to feel his pain and his betrayal and his rejection. And then it's meant to emphasise grace. So today we begin the book of Hosea. And I've got to tell you, there's a number of books in the Bible. Hosea's one of them, Ezekiel's one. They're they're not pretty. They're hard to read. They're not the ones you gather your kids around the table and you just read them. And one of the reasons it's not pretty is they show us our utter depravity and rebellion against God. 
And it's not pretty because it shows us who we are. When you read this, don't think you're Hosea. You're Gomer. We are Gomers, uncovered, naked, immoral, pathetic. But even more, we see God, this unrelenting lover who loves us in spite of who we are. And in this, we find the gospel. Now, in some books of the Bible, you struggle to know what the message is. Hosea is not one of those books. The overarching message of this book could not be clearer. And it's that God's grace is greater than my sin. God's grace is absolutely greater than my sin, your sin, anyone's sin. Now, to see this, have a look with me at the book of Hosea. Hosea is the first of the 12 minor prophets. So if you don't know where it is, find your way to Daniel, and then it's the first of the minor prophets right after that. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't even like the name minor prophets. Sounds like these are the less important ones. When you call them minor prophets, you're like, well, I don't need to read them, and when I do, I don't understand them, so I'm sort of ignoring them. They're only minor. They're not minor. They have an important message. They're minor only in the sense that they're shorter than books like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah. So if you've made your way there, have a look at Hosea 1.1. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri. So God calls out to Hosea and says, you're going to be a prophet. Now in Hebrew, his name is Hosea. Of course, when it went into the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, it got translated into Ose. And then when the English uh, translators came along, they took that and messed it up again, and it ended up as Hosea. But his name's actually Hosea, which means to save. It's from the same root word that Joshua and Jesus come from. His name's significant because, you see, this is a parable about how God saves. Now, he's called to prophesy, and he prophesies for a significant period of time, somewhere around 760 to 720 BC. And let me remind you about what was going on when he was called to prophesy. You remember, after King Solomon, the nation was split in two. There's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Northern kingdom, kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom, kingdom of Judah. Now, Hosea's ministry did cover the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. They were kings in that southern kingdom, Judah. But his main ministry was to the northern kingdom, to Israel. And his main ministry was during the reign of a king, King uh, Jeroboam. Jeroboam, and here it says the son of Jehoash. Now, that's important because, you see, there's another Jeroboam. The first king of that northern kingdom, Israel, was another Jeroboam. This is not that one. This is a different king, Jeroboam II. Now, maybe you know all about your kings of Israel. Maybe you don't. But let me tell you about this one. This guy was a brilliant ruler. He consolidated the northern kingdom's power. He defeated the enemies around the kingdom. He expanded the borders, and the result was this was a time of great peace and prosperity. The nation was doing well, but it wasn't, because spiritually the nation was a complete disaster. There's idolatry everywhere. There's the worship of Baals. There's the worship of the fertility gods. There is gross immorality, and it's not only that it was uh, he didn't discourage it, he encouraged it. So Hosea is called to this time where the people are enjoying this wealth and they're enjoying the immorality. And the last thing they want is some prophet coming and saying, this is bad. They didn't want to hear his message. So God comes to Hosea, this young single man, and says, you're going to be my prophet. Now, let me think about prophets for a minute. There are people clamoring to be prophets today, saying, yeah, yeah, I want to be a prophet. I want to speak for God. When you read the Old Testament, they weren't clamoring to be prophets. In fact, when they were called to be prophets, they were clamoring to say, unprofit me, choose someone else. I know what, what's going on here if I'm a prophet. They understood what would lay ahead of them. You were being drafted to do something dangerous, unpopular, 
and there were always significant life sacrifices. Look, you can go through all of them. Let me just remind you of a few of the prophets and what happened when they were caught. So God comes to Jeremiah and he says, Jeremiah, congratulations, you're a prophet. And he says, no thanks. I'm just a young guy. Pick someone else. God says, no, nah, you're my guy. Oh, and by the way, if you're faithful to the message, they're going to kill you um, and you're going to have a really tough life. And you read Jeremiah, and his life's filled with persecution and suffering, and he's finally carted off into Egypt where tradition says he's stoned at death. Isaiah, God calls him, and he goes, oh, no, I'm ruined. And God says, here's your ministry. Congratulations. You're going to go to the nation. You're going to preach, but all the hearts are going to be hard, and no one's ever going to listen to you. And he goes, great. (laughs) Now, read He has a tough ministry. At one point, God says, okay, here's what I want you to do. Take all your clothes off, take your shoes off, and go naked for three years. And you're like, what? Uh, And tradition says at the end of his life, King Manasseh has him killed for that message. Ezekiel. Ezekiel has it really tough. God calls him, and here's the pep talk God gives him. Ezekiel, I'm sending you to a rebellious house, and they're not going to listen to you. Sort of Isaiah stuff. And then he says, I'll tell you how tough your ministry is. It's going to be like you are living amid uh, briars, thorns, and scorpions. Awesome. That's what my life's going to be like. And he says, and you've got to stay faithful. Thank you, God. Now, read some of the things he has to do. At one point he says, for 390 days, you've got to go out and lie on your side. Now, you are showing them there's a siege of Jerusalem coming and they're almost going to starve to death. So you've got to nearly starve to death. You've got to eat almost nothing. And the tiny little bit you do eat, you've got to cook it on human excrement. Great. Another point in his ministry, God says, oh, I'm taking your wife from you. I'm going to kill her. And you cannot mourn. No crying. Because I want them to know what it's like when I take something they delight away from them. At the end of his life, he's carted off into captivity in Babylon. This is what it's like to be a prophet. You can read any of them. Read Daniel. Read any of them. It's tough. Hebrews 11 says, this is what it's like to be a prophet. They're tortured. They experience mocking, scourgings, bonds, imprisonment. They're stoned, sword in two, died by the sword, wandered about in sheepskin, goatskins, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. They wandered in deserts and mountains, hiding in caves, holes in the ground. This is not what you really want. So Hosea, call, here's the Lord saying, Hosea, you're going to be my prophet. His stomach would have dropped and he's like, what's coming? He could never have imagined what his ministry and how he would live out his prophetic calling. In my estimation, the prophets were starved, beaten, imprisoned, widowed. They had it easy in comparison. In my estimation... Hosea has the hardest prophetic ministry in the Old Testament. And that's saying something. So God says, you are going to live out an enacted parable through your family life. Congratulations, you are going to have the worst marriage imaginable and the worst family life imaginable. Go. But through this, what we're going to see in the first three chapters is a parable of unrelenting grace. I'm going to look at it this week. We're going to finish it next week. What happens to Hosea is meant to point to a spiritual truth, and it's the main point of this morning's message. What is it? Until you realise how much you've betrayed God, you won't understand the full glory of grace. Until you realise how much you've betrayed God, you're not going to understand the gospel. You're not going to understand grace. You see, When we sin, we minimise it. It's not that bad. This parable says, let me show you from God's side just how bad your sin is. Now, this parable is the gospel in three persons. We're going to meet two this week, one next week. Together, we're going to present the gospel, and the first one we're going to meet is the betrayed husband. Now, living out the role of the betrayed husband, congratulations, Hosea, it's you. Verse 2, go and marry a woman and have children. Now, I left out a couple of words. We'll come to those words. 
It is fascinating to me that when God sets out to illustrate what his relationship with his people is going to be like, there's a number of things. But king and servant, yep, but not the primary. Uh, Priest and people, yep, but not the primary. What is the primary illustration of God and God's people? It's a husband and a wife. He wants us to understand that it is meant to have this union, this intimacy, this exclusive, unshakable bond. And that is how God says it is meant to be between him and his people. So marriage is this good institution designed by God. Now, the majority of men want to marry and have children. Most guys, when they reach this age where girls begin to look somewhat attractive instead of not attractive, uh, they start thinking, I wonder who I'm going to marry. And they have this idea of who they might marry, and then they have this idea of what married life and having children will be. And most guys are like most girls, they have this romanticized fairy tale idea of marriage. You marry the beautiful girl, and you have this wonderful union, happy family, you grow old together, and you die in your bed surrounded by your children and your grandchildren. Awesome! Now, unfortunately, not all marriages go that way. And there are marriages where bad things happen and sometimes even the worst thing. There there can be adultery. They can be intimate with someone who's not their spouse and it destroys their lives. But here's the thing. I have yet to meet a decent human being who went in a marriage with a plan that that's the way the marriage would go. No decent person walks down the aisle with any other thought than I'm going to be faithful to that one for life and they're going to be faithful to me for life. Here's what I also want to say. If you're younger and not yet married and you're thinking of getting married and you are not sure that you can be exclusively faithful and not sure they're going to be exclusively faithful, turn and run. Uh, You do not want to walk down the aisle. So imagine being this young man We're not sure, but uh, there's a fair chance he was probably mid to late teens. He's young. And he's hoping to marry. He's hoping to have this great, happy family. And then God appears and says, verse 2, go and marry a woman of promiscuity and have children of promiscuity. Huh? Hosea, this is how you're going to be called to serve God. Marry a promiscuous woman... And when she bears children from that promiscuity, children who aren't yours, be a father to them. Now, I suspect Hosea would have said something like, oh, whoa, I must have misheard you. I know you hate immorality. I hate immorality too. I think you meant to say, Hosea, my prophet, my man, (laughs) go marry a woman of integrity. Have children from that bond of integrity. I want you to have this marriage that pictures the way it is meant to be. Faithfulness. I'll put my hand up for that, God. And God says, no, 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 Hosea, you heard right. Marry a promiscuous woman. Look, there's so many questions about this verse. Commanding a prophet to marry a promiscuous woman is shocking. If it doesn't feel shocking to you, you don't understand this. In fact, it's so shocking, many have said it didn't happen. It's just a parable. It's just a story. God would never actually ask a flesh and blood man to go and marry someone like Gomer. You know what? We often tell God what he should and shouldn't do. Habakkuk, he's like, you know what, God? There is no way you can or should use those barbarous, sinful Babylonians to punish your people. Can't do it. But you know what God says again and again throughout the Bible? He says, I am God and I'll do as I please. And he says to Hosea, this is what you're going to do. Now, the reason we struggle to accept this is because it's so shocking. It is so shocking. It is wrong. And if you're feeling that, good. We are meant to feel that this is wrong, this is shocking, this is not the way it is. It is meant to be something that we're like, how can God ask this of Hosea? Because 
what we're supposed to do is understand that as bad as our immorality is against a flawed human spouse, being immoral towards a holy God, the creator, the one who made us, bought us, owns us, it is so far in a different league of horror. So there's nothing to suggest that this is anything other than reality. Hosea goes and marries the promiscuous Goma. Next question. Is God saying Goma is only going to become immoral? That right now she's a good girl. She hasn't been with other guys, but you're going to marry her and bad luck, she's going to be immoral after you're married. Or... Is this meant to imply she's already immoral? She's known as not a good girl. It's hard to say. Some point to places like Leviticus 21. A priest cannot marry a woman who is immoral. And they go, well, if a priest can't do that, why would God tell a prophet to do it? Yeah, but then again, you know, we find that this is supposed to picture Israel. And Israel wasn't exactly this chaste, good girl when God called her out of Egypt. She was no pure nation. She had been tainted by the love of other gods when he called her into a covenant relationship. So look, I think on balance, it is likely that Goma is already immoral and known to be so. Now the question, what does it, what does it mean that she's immoral? She's immoral in the sense of promiscuous, that she's sleeping around because of lust, Or is Is she a prostitute? Is she selling herself for worldly gain? Again, the choice is hard. The CSB uses the word promiscuous. The ESV translation says, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom. Look, in those days, women rarely slept around in a promiscuous way. The shame and consequences were too great. Um, Today, immorality just doesn't carry the same shame and burden. In the days of Hosea, a woman who's just immoral would be cut off from family, cut off from societal support, ostracised. But here's the double standard. Prostitutes, they're despised, but they're tolerated. And they can support themselves through their immorality. And when you read this book in later chapters, Israel is selling her love for gain. It's a business transaction. Hey, Baal, I will worship you, but you will send the rain so that we will have our crops and our wealth. Now, it did devolve into lust and debauchery. So the context of the book seems to be more prostitution, whoredom. Now, if the word whore shocks you, again, it is meant to shock you. It is bad. It is really bad. We don't even like to say the word, but that is what our dalliance with the world is. So on balance, I think Goma is probably already known as the prostitute. She's someone who sold something incredibly precious to anyone who would pay her. She's an outcast. And you put all that together and God comes to Hosea and says, Hosea, go marry Goma. You know, I can barely comprehend that. I suspect Hosea is like most guys. I don't know exactly where he is living, but probably not all that many eligible girls around. He's probably gone through the entire list, probably ordered them. And I can tell you, it's not that Goma's at the bottom of the list. She's not on the list. He's like, I'd rather die. I'd rather be single. There's just no way. I mean, how do you go tell your parents, your friends, hey, good news, I'm getting married. Bad news, marrying Goma, the town prostitute. What what are they going to think? He knew marrying her means his life's ruined. He's shunned. Every dream he has for a happy family, gone. Now, I will also say there's a part of me that has some sympathy for Goma. I don't think there's any girls who grow up dreaming of being a prostitute. The ones that end up there usually come out of these terrible family situations and they have little life choices. I also suspect, when you read this book, I suspect Hosea was not the most romantic suitor. Uh, I suspect he probably came to Goma something like, I'm here because God sent me. I'm here under sufferance. I'm going to marry you, but not because I choose you, but because God told me I don't have a choice. 
let's do it. You know, so it's just the kind of stuff every girl wants to hear. But regardless, this is his call to ministry. Hosea, go marry a whore, someone who will sell herself to any man. Oh, and by the way, in case you have this romantic pretty woman notion that you're going to turn her life around and she's going to love you and it's all going to be happy and good. No, ain't happening. She's going to sleep around. It's going to get pregnant to those lovers. Oh, and when those children come, you've got to be a father to them. That's your task. Go. Be on your way. Now, I can tell you full well, if that were me, I would be tendering my resignation as a prophet. Thank you for the offer. My ministry is short, sweet, undistinguished. Find some other sap, not me. Problem is, plenty of these prophets tried to resign. Pick someone else. Here's all my excuses. Not a good speaker, too young, can't do it. And God's like, nah, nah, not happening. You're my man. Why would God ask someone to do this? Well, God asks many of us to make sacrifices, sometimes enormous ones, sometimes things far greater than giving our life for the cause. And this is one of those times. So God is asking Hosea to take on this horrendous role for one reason, so that you and I and all the people of God can understand what it is like when we are unfaithful to God. Look at the end of verse 2. For the land, the people, are committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. See, Hosea represents God, and Gomer represents the immoral nation. Now, later in Hosea, Israel's like, what do you mean? We're not Gomer. How do you compare us to a prostitute? What do you think? And Hosea, the book is, oh, you bet you are. See, to God, worshipping another God, idolatry, giving our heart to anything else, there is no greater treachery. And if you're shocked at this, then you're on the right track of understanding how God feels. See, here is the point. The betrayed husband... It's not just Hosea, it's a holy God. God's the one we betray. What happens to Hosea, it's meant to make us see things from God's perspective. What happened to Hosea, it's horrific. But it is nothing compared to what it is like to betray a holy, perfect God. Now, you've got to understand, the picture painted in the Old Testament and reinforced in this book is that here's the people, they're in slavery, They're in Egypt, they're worshipping these other gods, and he calls them out, and in the wilderness, he says, we're going to commit. We're going to covenant. Exodus 20, 1 to 5, God spoke these words. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have other gods beside me. Do not make an idol for yourself. Do not bow and worship to them. Do not serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Israel enters in a covenant, and Israel said, I do. You're our God. We're going to have no others. First thing I want to say is, do you realise how amazing that he chose them in the first place? In Deuteronomy 7, it's made clear. It's not like, hey, don't think that God had all of these, and he was like, who is the best nation out there? Oh, who is the really good-looking girl, Chase, the one I want to marry, Israel. No, he's like, you're nothing. You're the least of them. You're bottom of my list, and I chose you. See, this is not a Cinderella story. This is not handsome prince falls for pure, beautiful, kind girl, and they live happily ever after. This is not that story. This is handsome prince who can have any bride in the kingdom, and he chooses the poor, homely, overweight girl, terrible body odour. Worse, she's a prostitute. And he says, I choose to love you. I choose you to be my queen. I choose to give you my kingdom. Will you be faithful to me? And she's like, 
Me? You want me? I guess so. I'm not stupid. Prince wants me. Yeah, sure, I'll be faithful to you. But no, I won't. See, there's no pretty woman scenario where the prince rescues her and her life is cleaned up and it's happily ever after. She says, sure, I'll make a commitment. And she slinks out and sells herself to any low-life scum, even gets pregnant to them. Read the Old Testament. What happens straight after the Ten Commandments and the commitment and the will be faithful? We get the golden calf. And that's just the beginning of the unfaithfulness. Now, it is not that God is surprised at this. It's not that God's like, oh, shock, never saw the golden calf coming. God knew. When he called Adam and created him, he knew he's going to be unfaithful. When God chose Israel from slavery in Egypt and said, here's this land, milk and honey, kings and law, he knew they're going to betray him. When God chose you, he knew about your unfaithfulness. But you see, our God chooses to love anyway. But that does not lessen the pain and the betrayal that he feels. Look, fortunately, in my years of ministry, I only had to deal with this incredible betrayal of the marriage covenant through adultery, through immorality a few times. I can tell you, the pain and the betrayal and the hurt, it is just unbelievable. And yet, usually, when we're sitting there, the one who has done the betraying has said something like this. I'll put my hand up. What I did was totally wrong. But you've got to realise what it's like to live with this one. Terrible. There's been no emotional or physical intimacy for a long time. There have been harsh words. They don't love me. I don't feel love. I just needed to feel loved. Israel can't say that. We can't say that. God is perfect. He is holy. He is loving. He did not fail Israel in any way. He does not fail you. There is no excuse for our immorality, our adultery, our betrayal, our sin. Now the focus moves to the promiscuous wife. Now, in reality, these verses focus not so much on Gomer, but on the fruit of her promiscuity, her children. And there's three children, and each one represents a phase of the, the, the nation, a prog progress in the unfaithfulness. Look at verses 3 to 5. So he went and married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel, for in a little while I'll bring the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in Jezreel Valley. So he's a beardy and he goes, he marries Goma, they come together and she falls pregnant. Now, we are couples that are expecting, some of them are expecting their first child, and one of the first things they do when they find out, yay, yeah, yeah, I'm pregnant, is, hey, what are we going to call them? And there's this list of names, and there's some on the list and some not on the list. You know, Daniel, God's my judge, Nathaniel, gift of grace, carries grace. You know, there's things that are on the list. I haven't had any parents come and go, you know, we're trying to decide for a boy. Are we going with Chernobyl or Hiroshima? What do you reckon? <laughs> you know, which one rings more? Uh, nobody comes and says, hey, you know, I like bloodshed or vengeance. She likes retribution or judgment. You know, where should we go? I need to say, you know, if those kind of things are on your list, um, you can be parents, but you can't be naming parents. Um, <laughs> the elders have taken that role off you. I'm sorry. Um, but here, God instructs Hosea to call his first son Jezreel. Now, the name actually means God will scatter. Uh, and it is a reference to the scattering of that northern kingdom that's coming. But there's more going on here. This was an infamous place in Israel's history. If you read 2 Kings 9 and 10, we read about the bloodshed of Jezreel. Here's what happens. So the nation splits in two. 
So the northern kingdom there, the first king is Jeroboam, the original Jeroboam. And guess what? He is a terrible guy. He is evil. And after him, there's these coups, these assassinations, there's all these different kings. Finally, this king called Ahab is on the throne there. And he has a wife called Jezebel. Let me say, Ahab, Jezebel, two more names to take off your list of potential baby names. Um, these guys are bad. And here's what they did. They bring the worship of Baal to Israel. And God says, oh, no. No, you don't. So he raises up a guy called Jehu. And there's this very bloody war in the valley of Jezreel. And out of it, Jehu becomes king. Now, Jehu starts off okay. He goes, thank you, God. I like being king. I'm going to be faithful to you. Great. I'm making my covenant to you. And he starts off okay. He says, let's get rid of the Baals. And they start doing that. But he's like, oh, every other form of immorality, evil in the kingdom, that can stay. I'm, I'm only getting rid of the Baals. And so he does. But do you know what? When you've got all this other immorality, the Baals rest straight back in. And so he founds this dynasty that is unfaithful. And so Jeroboam II is part of that dynasty. And by the time of his days, everything's there. It is really a bad, immoral place. And God says, enough. The dynasty started in Jezreel with bloodshed. It's going to end there. He says, I'm going to break your bow, the bow of resistance. The Assyrians come in, and the bow of uh, Israelite resistance was broken there, and it led to, in 722, the nation being scattered and destroyed. Jehu said, I will be faithful. He was not. God acted. That's their first child. It gets worse. Verses 6 and 7. She conceived again, gave birth to a daughter, and the Lord said to her, Name her Lo Ruhamah, for I'll no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. I'll certainly take them away. But I will have compassion on the house of Judah, and I'll deliver them by the Lord their God. I will not deliver them by bow, sword, or war, or by horses and cavalry. So first child, at least there seemed to be a good start. That first child actually was Hosea's. This kid isn't. Notice the difference here. Verse 3, Gomer conceived and bore him, Hosea, a son. It's Hosea's kid. Here it just says she conceived and gave birth to a daughter. This child isn't Hosea's. She is the fruit of whoredom. It's one of her lovers. And God says her name is Lo Ruhama. No compassion, no mercy. Or some translations like the NIV say not loved. Can I say... Take that name off your kids' names. Not loved is not a good name. <laughs> Imagine your father going, not loved. I don't love you because you've got another father and everyone needs to know. That's tough. Imagine that poor kid. But it happens to show how God feels. This betrayal forces God to withdraw his compassion. Not something God does easily. When Moses is on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, here's what the Lord says. The Lord. The Lord is what? What's the first word? Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations. The first word he uses to describe himself is, I'm compassionate. Now he says, you have forced me to withdraw my compassion. Now, God's compassion and his love lead to God's protection. When the compassion goes, he'll scatter them. He'll destroy them. Now, I want you to notice here, at this point, the compassion is withdrawn from Israel, the northern kingdom, but not from Judah, the southern kingdom. Here's the difference. So, Jeroboam 2, 20 years later, there's this king, the last one, Hoshea, who's on the throne of Israel. This nation called Assyria is coming down. And what does Hosea do? He doesn't say, Lord God of Israel, please protect us. You know, we're your people. Help. No, he says, 
hey, we need to get send message to Egypt. They'll come and help us. We need their horses and their bows and their arrows. And hey, everybody out there, pray to our gods, the Baals and fertility gods and anyone you can think of, pray to them. Anybody there it is except the God of Israel. And God says, for that you're done. Now, Hezekiah is the king of Judah. So after the Assyrians wipe out the northern kingdom, they're heading to the southern kingdom, and they say, hey, Hezekiah, you got no hope. No one's coming to your aid, and even if they did, you know, horses and bows and arrows, they're not going to save you. Your cactus, give up. Hezekiah prostrates himself and says, Lord, you are greater than them. We're in your hands. The kings of the earth are nothing. And God said, good choice, Hezekiah. Well done. I'm going to save you. And he does. So at this point, that northern kingdom is wiped out and destroyed. The southern kingdom has a reprieve. Look, you're supposed to feel God's betrayal here. He's a faithful husband. His wife says a second time, I'm pregnant. And he's like, is it mine? No, it's not. She sold herself. She gets pregnant. This is Israel saying, we trust Egypt. We trust the Baals, not you. I can't even imagine what it's like for your wife to be pregnant with somebody else's child and you've got to love that child. But God says, that's how I feel. Gets worse, verses 8 and 9. And after Gomer had weaned Lo-Fruhama, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, name him Lo-Ami, for you're not my people and I will not be your God. Now, once again, Hosea is not the father. This is another child of whoredom. This one's name, he says, is going to be Lo-Ami, not my people. There is a progression here. So first one, Hosea is the father. God does scatter, and it leads to the end of the dynasty there in the northern kingdom. Second one, Hosea is not the father. No compassion. Compassion's withdrawn, ends Israel. But he's still got Judah. And now it's, no, Hosea is not the father. Leads to this one is not my people and the end of Judah. Hosea's main ministry is to Israel. And he pronounces the end of the dynasty in Israel and the kingdom of Israel. But it doesn't mean that he has nothing to say to Judah. Hezekiah was faithful. Now, he made a few mistakes too, but overall he was faithful. Kings after him, not. There's some bad ones that come. They begin to walk in the footsteps of the northern kingdom. Now, if you want to understand what's going on, read Ezekiel. Ezekiel outlines what happens. Now, I was going to read bits of Ezekiel 23. I read them out to Roy, and Roy said, you can't read that out. I'm like, it's scripture, because you cannot read this. You've got to give them the PG-13 version. So, if you're over 18, you can read Ezekiel 23 later. Um, <laughs> let me give you this. He says, I'm going to tell you how I feel. He says, let me tell you a little story. There were two prostitutes living in Egypt. We're going to call them Ahola and Aholabah. He goes, all right, you saw through it. They're actually Israel and Judah. And he says, I'm calling them. I'm washing them. I'm making them mine, giving them everything. And Israel becomes unfaithful. Now, it is not at all PG-13 when you read what happened. Lusting after the nations, wealth and other gods, defiles itself. And God says, I've got no choice. Destroy it. And then it's like, of course her sister will see this and go, I'm not doing that. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be good. No, she walks exactly the same path, idolatry and immorality. God says, I've got to destroy you too. And you know what Judah says? Are you kidding? Our sin's really trivial. What would you, what would you destroy? You're going to have no people. Finally, God said, yeah, everyone has betrayed me. And the most tragic words, these are so tragic. You're not my people. I am not your God. I'm not your God. 
A holy God can't be joined to an immoral, unrepentant people. It's going to separate from them. See, the promiscuous wife is the sinful people. It's the second person in our gospel. God created us, and he created us to be in covenant. We sinned in Eden. God says, okay, I'm going to call another people for myself, Israel, and they sinned. Now, in chapter 4 onwards, Israel is going to object. Basically, they're going to say, yeah, we are sinful, but why on earth are you comparing us to Goma? She's a prostitute. We're not that bad. Do not say to us, we're that bad. Now, God's going to clearly demonstrate, hey, if the shoe fits. But here's the point. You read books like Ezekiel, and the sin of God's people is horrific. Let me give you another thing to read. Go and read Ezekiel 8. God takes Ezekiel right into the heart of the temple, the temple, the holy place. And he says, look around. What do you see? And he goes, oh, I see people and priests worshipping little carved idols and stone idols and metal idols. He says, look over there. What do you see? Oh, there's women weeping after the god Tammuz. What do you see over there? I see priests worshipping the sun as it comes up. And he goes, and this is in my holy place. And you reckon I can put up with it? And when he points this out, they say, our sin's trivial. It's not that bad. Certainly not enough to destroy us. Why are you so worked up, God? See, this is often us. So often, when we sin, we're like, yeah, but I'm not that bad. God created marriage, the institution of marriage, for many reasons. One is to show us what exclusive intimacy looks like, what it means to have no other gods. But another reason is to show us how God feels when we sin. It is a betrayal of the worst kind. One God, no other gods. God hates our lust and our greed and our idolatry and our sin. I can tell you, if you've gone out sharing the gospel, one of the hardest parts of evangelism is often convincing someone that they're a sinner because they've got the wrong standard. You tell them that and they're like, are you telling me I'm as bad as Adolf Hitler? I'm no Adolf Hitler. I am no sinner. But even Christians often fail to grasp this. Often a Christian has these respectable sins. Hey, unless I've actually committed adultery, a bit of porn's not that bad. A bit of dabbling in the world or the thinking of the world or the greed of the world or whatever, it's not that bad. I don't feel that broken. Oh, I should be, I know, but I'm not. And anyway, grace covers my sin. God wants us to know what it's like for him when we do that. You see, the point of this, some people read this and they go, you know what, here's the point I take away from this. I have a bad spell, so I have to be a Hosea and go after them. Now, it's true, you do have to be a Hosea and go after them, but you know what, that's not the point. You're not Hosea. You're not Hosea in any way. You're Goma. You are go- Every one of us is a Goma. That is the point. The best of us here this morning is a Goma. And God should cut us off, divorce us, and have nothing to do with us. But God is unrelentingly gracious. See, Genesis 3 ends with Adam and Eve thrown out of the garden. And the most stunning thing is that there is a Genesis 4. That God didn't just draw the line and say, that is it, done. It is equally stunning that when you read through Hosea 1, 1 to 9, about Israel's failure, Judah's failure, and it is our failure, what is incredible is that there's not one more verse that reads like this. And the Lord decreed, I divorce thee, I divorce thee, I divorce thee. And Israel, Judah, and every last person are banished from the Lord's love and doomed to face the eternal punishment they so richly deserve. End of the book of Hosea. That's what we'd expect to happen. Everything inside us says that's what should happen. Hosea should divorce Gomer. God should divorce us. That's it. But that is not what happens. 
Now, a little sneak preview for next week. Look at verse 10. Yet the number of the Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where they're told, you are not my people, they'll be called sons of the living God. And you read it and you go, what? It's sort of like Hosea, go marry a promiscuous woman. You read this and you go, what? After all our immorality, we're going to be sons of the living God? It is unexpected. Now, I don't know who decided to divide Hosea up the way they did. All I can tell you is verses 10 and 11 do not belong with the first nine. They belong with chapters 2 and 3. And in this next section, we're going to meet someone. In verse 11, they're called the single ruler, the one ruler. In chapter 3, it's called a king like David. And he's going to be the third person we meet in this parable. He's the one who makes sense of this parable. God's going to say to Hosea, go and love him again. He says, because that's what I do. But in that instance, Hosea's going to love them like Christ. See, there is a way back for Israel. Now, it's not just Israel. You get to Romans 11 and Paul says, hey, Gentiles, good news. It's not just Israel. We can be grafted into this way back too. And the way back is grace and it's through Christ. And yes, you don't deserve it, just as Goma doesn't deserve it and Israel doesn't deserve it and no one does. But that's what grace is. It is totally undeserved, unrelenting love. Look, I've done a lot of marriage counselling. Most of it doesn't deal with the big stuff like adultery. Most of it, it's the little stuff. Communication, finances, in-laws, whatever. And it's all these little things. And yet by the time they're sitting there, they're saying... I don't know how we can go forward. I don't know how we can return home and love each other again. I'm thinking, for that stuff, what would happen if something big happened? And what would happen if it's not just adultery once, but repeated adulteries? It's impossible. Christ does the impossible. See, ultimately, this is a pretty woman kind of story. And the prince does come, and he does change the girl. We are Gomers. And in the Old Testament, if a husband found anything unclean in his wife, he'd just divorce her. God doesn't. He separates from Israel, but as we'll see next week, he goes and loves her again. It's because the message of Hosea is not, you are irretrievably broken and that's the end. The message is, Without this third person we're going to meet, without Christ, you are irretrievably broken and without hope. But with Christ, there is hope. God's grace is so much greater than our sin. Yes, we are failures. We are gomers. And one of the things I keep hearing is, I'm such a sinner, how can God love me? I have betrayed a holy God. And you know what? Without Christ, there isn't a way. But with Christ, there is a way. And God knows who you are. He knew you were no prize. He knew you were a goma when he called you. But he chose to love you. Next week, we're going to get to Hosea 3.1. The Lord says, go again and show love to a woman who's loved by another man and is an adulteress. That's how the Lord loves the Israelites, loves his people. This is an amazing picture of grace. And here's the glory of it. You can't be faithful. I can't be faithful. Adam couldn't be faithful. Abraham couldn't. David couldn't. Hosea can't. None of us can. But Christ is faithful. And he's going to join us to himself and we're going to get his faithfulness so that one day there will be a marriage supper of the Lamb. And we are going to sit there and we are going to be clean and we are going to be spotless and we are going to be faithful but not one of us is going to go because I did it. Because I kept myself faithful. I was the amazing bride. We're all going to go, I am only here because of Christ. And that is the gospel. It is undeserved grace that is far, far greater than our sin. And we're going to come to Christ next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these pictures. Oh Lord, you know us. We are unfaithful. You know us. We're not as broken over our sin as we should. 
Help us to see these pictures of what it is like from your side to feel this pain, this betrayal, this agony. Help us to understand this. And then we will understand even more the amazing glory and power of your unrelenting love and grace in Christ. Help us to understand the gospel, but more than that, help us understand it to the point where we just can't keep it to ourselves, that we have to tell others of this love and this grace. In Christ's name, amen.